Welcome to the Lens Rentals Podcast. I'm Ryan Hill. This week, I'm talking with Dom, the video producer at Lens Pro to Go, about a new lens we're both super excited about, the Canon 5.2 millimeter dual fisheye. We shot with this lens and an R5 for a few days each, and we think that that combination of gear might have the potential to revolutionize VR video production. Here's how you can get started shooting VR with the Canon 5.2 millimeter dual fisheye. Dom, welcome to the podcast. It's good to talk to you. Oh, hey, Ryan. Thanks for having me. We had some technical issues we had to figure out. Uh, so yeah, we, you're hearing this after five minutes of fiddling with microphones and headphones, but we're, we've are we got it. We're figured out. We're ready to go. Yes. Next thing, uh, lightning strike is going to hit the Zencaster headquarters and wipe out all their servers. We'll see. Not that I want that to happen. I we Thanks to the good people at Zencaster. Well, we, <laughs> well, we love you guys. Just with our luck, yeah, yeah. that's what will happen. <laughs> right. Yes. It hasn't been going great, but it's going great now. We're doing a rare single product episode uh, because this thing is so complicated and there are so many different ways to use it. We are talking only about the Canon 5.2 millimeter fisheye, dual fisheye for VR, which you had uh, a chance to shoot with recently um, on a couple of different YouTube videos. Those will both be out by the time we're releasing this episode. So first of all, we'll link to those if you're interested in seeing some like sample footage and a review on this lens. But I want you to start, Dom, by just describing this thing as simply as you can, because it is it, it's very unusual. A lot to talk about here. Um, yeah, it's 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 pretty strange. So I don't know where do I start. This thing has two lenses inside of it. Like there's just there's an elephant in the room here. Like this lens yeah. has two lenses inside of it. So <laughs> you can basically think of this thing as having like two five millimeter fish eyes in it next to each other. And we'll talk about why that matters in a second, but just two really wide angle lenses next to each other. And then if you notice uh, towards the lens mount at the exit pupil, it actually also has two um, little exit pupils there. What's pretty sweet is those optics are actually getting like snaked around in there. So they're kind of getting like angled um, in order to fit in that like small uh, sort of lens mount which is an RF mount because this was um, this whole system was designed for the Canon mirrorless system for Canon mirrorless cameras to be able to uh, shoot 180 degree stereoscopic VR. And when I say this, I, I got to remind everybody that I'm like a half step of it ahead of anybody that's listening right now. This whole, <laughs> this whole VR process for me, was completely new to me. And this, this lens was my introduction to shooting VR. I've used VR and put on a VR headset for 15 minutes without feeling nauseous before. So I've considered myself like having broken the ice in that way. Yeah. But I've never um, done the production end of it. Um, so it's super cool that Canon is streamlining this um, in this way. And they pretty much single-handedly did it with this lens. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a very appropriate amount of experience to come into this thing with because I think it's very much aimed for people who are not necessarily experts in VR. Completely. It's totally bridging that gap because um, VR can be kind of a scary thing if you don't even know where to start. And this is a pretty good primer for that type of thing. Yeah, having shot, uh, you know, a, not like a paid gig or anything, but I the Insta 360s are various like Insta 360 cameras, which look more like a traditional 360 VR camera where it's a big, yeah, uh, like volleyball size sphere with a bunch of tiny fish eyes all over it. Those are the cam- kind of cameras you'll need to shoot like a full 360 VR and are much more complicated to use, both in terms of production and in terms of post production. The stitching the software, uh, you know, stitching all the footage together in post. But before we get into the post-production workflow, what cameras will this 5.2 millimeter fisheye work on right now? So full workflow, full compatibility with the firmware and everything. <clears throat> it's only the R5. This this will only work with the EOS R5. That's the only Canon mirrorless body that they've rolled out the VR software for that it's it's only included in the r5s right now can it be included in other bodies maybe soon but i have a feeling that they did it in the r5 because it has that 8k recording mode 
And right. I'm pretty sure that they did that because um, those super high resolution modes are really important for this type of thing. Right now, this is only supported on the R5 because of the resolution necessary to finish uh, these types of files. So if this if we didn't adequately describe this in uh, the beginning, the thing is giving you is two images on your sensor. Those images then get split into a left eye and right eye in the software. So you kind of need a high resolution to begin with. So once those images are split and stitched, you're still working uh, with a pretty high resolution file. Yeah, thank you, because I meant to mention that before. So each of those lenses in this thing give their own image circle in the image. So like when you're looking at the camera, it's just like two circular images right next to each other. So when you're recording in 8K, technically each one of those image circles is like roughly a 4K image. And so you're really only looking at like one 4K image like at a time like when you're looking around and like you get to see all the stuff <clears throat> to the left and to the right of you and up and down, that's like the entire 8K image. So I think that's I think that's why the 8K higher or super high res thing is so important. Right. And and speaking of kind of looking around and like the angles that you're provided here, the fact that it is 180 is maybe a hurdle for people who are possibly used to like a full 360 VR. Have you viewed much 180, uh, 180 degree VR content? Yeah, well, I will say this. I don't view much VR content. And um, that that I have has probably been on Facebook because actually the integration was on Facebook um, long before um, it was on YouTube. But anyways, if I were to say I probably have seen and watch more 360 degree VR stuff than 180. But I also see 180 degrees purpose. It has more of like a um, POV type thing where yeah. 360 is kind of just like a pure like world explorer um, type thing where you can really feel like freely view around. 180 kind of seems the incentive there kind of seems to just like it's like a little bit you can look around, but it's mostly you're stuck with the perspective of the camera. I totally agree. I think those are like good example use cases. I, yeah. I've, I've watched a lot of this stuff. I, I think the best use case for this is like documentary style. The New York Times specifically produces a lot of VR documentaries that I think are very well made. Uh, and I, I think for that kind of thing, for either narrative or documentary, for a kind of thing where you're trying to focus your viewer's attention to a degree on something, but still giving your viewer the option to kind of choose what they're looking at. It's able to be immersive, but there is still a chosen point of view. There's something you should be looking at in general. Whereas I think 360 makes a lot more sense for almost like a tourism kind of thing. Like we're, we're putting a 360 degree camera on a tripod in the middle of like, I don't know, the Spanish steps or the Coliseum or whatever. That is for just kind of you're in a place, not necessarily being told a story, yeah. at least in my opinion. You know, it's kind of funny when I was uh, editing my video or when I was watching the um, video on YouTube afterwards, the sample footage video, and I'm kind of scrolling around to myself, I'm realizing like, wow, this is like the worst tool to give a total ADD child like me, <laughs> because this is what I do in real life when somebody's talking to me. I'm like, where else yeah, can I look? Whipping your head around. Person's eyes. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Like, don't give me that tool on a video. This is my one chance to simulate eye contact with another human being. <laughs> like state-of-the-art storytelling technology, and I'm just using it to, to look, yeah, at, look at your feet or whatever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so let's talk about like the, you know, the physical shooting experience uh, when using this lens. What should people know? Because there are you know, some quirks you have to consider that you don't necessarily have to consider with a traditional lens. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I'll start by saying that this thing, this is Canon L glass. This is, this is a Canon L lens. It's, it's 2.8 to f16. It focuses. It actually can articulate focus, even giving it being um, a super, super wide uh, angle lens or lenses combined focal length whatever it is mm -hmm. so at 28 you're actually you actually have a pretty defined um depth of field so if you are shooting at 28 
you should really do that um, sort of magnifying trick. I, I go into it in my video, but <clears throat> when you're looking through the live view in the camera, you can magnify and then that'll show you a focus magnification and then you'll do the focus ring on the lens. But then you hit info and that'll actually toggle between the view from each image circle in the lens just to make sure that both lenses are in focus and you can actually like adjust the focus on each lens. So anyways, make sure that the focus is uh, sharp before you're about to shoot. 100%. It's very easy to accidentally misfocus. Right. In a way that is not apparent in the footage if you're viewing it back on the uh, camera LCD, but is very apparent if you're viewing it back on like a VR headset. Yeah. Um, yeah, totally. I couldn't agree more. So when you're viewing it in that like double circle mode, I call it mosquito vision. Um, I like that. That yeah, makes sense right. to me. <laughs> it's right. Exactly. It is. It is super, super hard to tell um, what's in focus. And even the magnify tool is like kind of sometimes misleading. So yeah, definitely make sure that's in focus. Honestly, if you want to um, avoid this problem, try to get into a well lit scenario and shoot at like F8, like at least you'll have way less of a problem there. But if you are fighting for light, shooting it wide open, um, magnify and focus first big time. Yeah, that's a very good point, because even if your subject is correctly in focus, depth of field in general can be very disorienting in VR, especially once you get 3D involved. Uh, so, yeah, even if your focus is set to the correct point, having a really shallow depth of field can kind of throw off your image anyway. So, right, there's that. So once I got my camera on the R5 and I shot first day or so um, just handheld and I was just kind of walking around just like hand holding it and... The R5's got, you know, IBIS and stuff. The lens definitely doesn't have any um, optical stabilization going on. Already a lot of optic stuff going on in there. Yeah. And at 5.2 millimeters, I think probably your in your in body stabilization should take care of it. Yeah, right. Exactly. Um, so given that, though, you're right. Um, it's it's a pretty it's pretty forgiving being that wide. But given that for the VR experience, you really want it to be as smooth as possible. So I pretty much exclusively recommend putting that thing on a gimbal um, if you're going to be doing any walking around stuff or um, if it is going to be stationary stuff a um a tripod is good or really really sturdily handheld footage um, because yeah. little little shakes and stuff will really be noticeable in the vr experience yeah personally i shot all my footage just locked off on a tripod and that's what i would recommend unless you're very careful with it I don't know. Maybe this is just me. I may have like a weak stomach or sense of balance, but I find any movement in like any camera movement in VR once you're actually viewing this stuff to be very disorienting. Well, that's completely why. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you yeah. are once you're making this content, you're, you know, ideally making it for somebody to get like immersed in. And yeah, like, sure, we do have like a little bit of wobble, like as we walk, just like in real life or whatever. But pretty much name of the game is keep it as steady as possible for VR shooting. I guess it depends on where you're sending the footage. So if it's just meant to be viewed on like YouTube and sort of clicked around to change the field of view, then that's not really a big deal at all. But if you want somebody to watch the thing on a headset, that's kind of a different story. <laughs> And I yeah. would I would probably steer clear of any camera movement in that case, at least keep. I feel like I keep harping on this point, but it was mainly because this hasn't happened to me in a while. I was surprised by like problems in my image in post. And I'm generally pretty careful about like checking that stuff before I start rolling. And I wasn't like rushed. I was just kind of like by myself shooting whatever I needed to shoot. But any problems with exposure, with um, artifacts from compression, with focus, almost everything is going to be a lot more apparent in the final product, especially if you're viewing it on a headset than it is in the rear LCD or a monitor or even the footage if you just open it up in your computer. Yeah, the number one tip if you're shooting with this thing for the first time is to just be very, very, very careful about every aspect of your image yeah couldn't agree more okay we'll take a quick break right there and when we come back i want to talk about post-production want a discount on your next order from lens rentals head to lensrentals.com slash podcast or follow the link in the show notes for a coupon code 
As the largest online photo and video equipment rental house in the world, Lens Rentals has been supplying both professionals and hobbyists for over 15 years. We carry everything from cameras and lenses to drones, computers, even VR headsets, all shipped straight to your door for whatever length of time you need. Rent the gear you need to get the shot and grab a discount at lensrentals.com slash podcast. That's lensrentals.com slash podcast. Now, I want to get into post-production because this, I think, is where this whole setup really shines and becomes an easier solution for VR for beginners or even like amateurs than any other VR solution. This is where it all comes together. Yeah. If you, if you were scared at all, like during your VR shooting, which you may be rightfully so, maybe it should have been. Oh yeah, absolutely. Rightfully so. Yeah, it's a, it, it's a very complicated process. It is. So in post is where um, you're going to be like, Oh wow. Like that is why all these things are like this. Yeah, it's very easy. Well, you uh, talk me through a little bit, you know, your experience bringing the footage out of the camera and into whatever NLE you used. Cool. Right. So um, it was Premiere. And uh, but before that, um, I'll just mention that Canon gives you like two avenues uh, for this. Basically, you can download Canon VR utility, the program itself. They have like a standalone program, it's just like a utility pretty much like a regular Canon utility program, just like they've released in the past, just does one thing. Or from the same page, you can get the plugin from uh, Premiere, which also will just work dormantly in Premiere. So I'll go through the um, VR utility thing first. You'll get the program up and, oh yeah, it'll mention that the free version of the plan will actually only let you export clips that are shorter than two minutes. Oh, okay, that was going to be one of my questions. So, yeah, it is a free version, but paid if you want a clip longer than two minutes. Right. Yeah, exactly. And for this video, I kind of purposefully just did the free trial and purposefully took my videos um, underneath two minutes because I don't have a real purpose for this right now to be <laughs> to make the subscription. So I just took like minute and a half long clips or so. But yeah, if you wanted to be able to export clips longer than two minutes, uh, you got to pay for the subscription. And that applies for the Adobe Premiere plugin as well. Oh, the, I yeah, didn't know that. Yeah, the plugin will know, it, it won't let you import any clips that are, or it will let you import them. It'll gray them out though, if they're longer than two minutes. So oh, okay, that's an important point. I guess I just happened to not shoot anything that was longer than two minutes because i i went straight to premiere uh, bypassed the canon software entirely right but didn't run into any problems uh with clip length so that's how much is it the software do you know i think it was it was either five or seven bucks a month and then it's cheaper for the yearly um oh it's a subscription yeah it's subscription based everything everything oh my god try i dare you to pay for something outright these days (laughs) Needless to say, whatever the cost is, it is a subscription, which is wild. That really sucks. I wish Canon uh, a criticism will uh, because this thing is very cool. I think this episode is going to be broadly positive, but a criticism is just give the software away. What are you doing? I know. Yeah, you you know, the lens is two thousand dollars. It's they didn't skimp on the price of the lens. Uh, right. Do you want people to buy the lens or not? And if you you know, if people are going to buy the lens, don't don't charge them seven dollars a month for software they need to view the footage out of this lens. Yeah. You know, would be would be nice. Or at least make it just a one time fee and don't charge people monthly. Anyway, I don't want to harp on that too much. <laughs> Maybe there is a monthly option. Who knows? Sorry, I, I took you off the rails to no, talk about no, it's fine. Right. Yeah, it. It so made me I, so mad. No. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so you were using the Canon stitching software first. Yeah, right. Either the VS, EOS VR utility software or the plugin. So um, I did use the um, standalone software first. So you just drop your clips in there. And that's when you will encounter the error of if they're not clips taken on the R5 with the firmware upgrade the program won't ingest them. It'll just say like no clips found or anything. Oh, right. Because it's not getting the metadata from the lens that it needs to interpret these clips. Yeah, exactly. That firmware update pretty much like bakes in some metadata that just exclusively makes those clips compatible with this program. So you select it by folder. So you go ahead and take that VR R5 media by folder 
um, select that, import it into the thing. You can do stills or movies um, too. Actually, there are tabs for that. I only did movies. And then it'll list all your media right there. And it takes a little time to uh, process them. And it's kind of funny. This hilarious little error message uh, pops up. Uh, where it's like, this may take tens of seconds to process. <laughs> it's, it's I don't funny. have tens of seconds to spare. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I know. So, uh, yeah, it's funny. And uh, it indeedly does. Like a long, a pretty long clip might take like as much as like a minute or so to process. But once you drop it in there, it automatically checks off the equirectangular projection mapping thing that it does which is the whole point of this so basically this software takes those that mosquito vision i was talking about earlier the double sphere sort of view that you have just in the raw 8k video on the r5 and it stretches out the edges of that circle into a square basically a square for each circle it turns each one of those circles into a square but um, it maps it in such a way that once you are using it with the vr goggles um, that distortion sort of i guess mimics like what you see in real life i don't know what that's xyz vr theory (laughs) stuff that i'm not really that uh um well versed on but the point is is that the software puts it into that equirectangular projection uh, for you, which is what's necessary for use with the VR headset. You can do little bits of correction in here, like you can pan, tilt, and roll the footage slightly. You can crop the clips, so the clip that it exports will be shorter than the raw file or whatever. And then you can also um, you can select a couple of file types and resolutions and stuff. And so the maximum one it allows is 8K. Pretty much because all this was really designed for the R5 workflow with that 8K um, resolution. You can record in lower resolutions, I I will say. You can record in 4K, but as I've said a million times in this, I really think it's beneficial to do the 8K. Yeah, if you're going to bother with this, I would definitely recommend 8K. So the exporting is uh, not so bad at all. I just exported back into MP4s and then it is the equirectangular uh, projection where it's still a 16 by nine video file. Um, but now it is basically ready for a VR headset. So super cool. And then the other option is the plugin in Premiere, which essentially just does all of this sort of behind the scenes, right when you drop the footage into your bin. This is what I used and I was very impressed with how easy it was. Oh, it it works really, really well. So I'm pretty sure this support has been in Premiere since uh, Premiere 2020. Like mm-hmm. it's it's like a year or so old or so, um, and it's totally compatible with this Canon VR workflow too. So I'm not sure what other cameras it would have used um, before this. Maybe um, I think it has some support for the Insta 360, like uh, 360 VR cams, which we also yeah. Have. Right, right, right. I think so. So anyways, um, what you're going to do is just drop that stereoscopic VR footage from the R5 that has the metadata baked in from the firmware, drop it into your media bin, your computer will start humming a little bit because it's going to process that stuff. It's going to do everything that the standalone program does, but just in Premiere. It's going to ingest that footage, recognize that it's 8k 180 degree stereoscopic vr footage and show it to you in the equirectangular projection in premiere once again just ready to go for the goggles and more importantly it's media that just like works in your timeline just like regular old media and that's kind of like the backbone that's like the most important thing of this whole like thing that canon developed here you're taking h264 10 bit 422 16 by 9 uh 8k video here you're not dealing with like three to four video signals all from all with uh wide angle lenses that you're stitching together in post um that is like the way you used to do this this program is like taking away all of that <laughs> it's making right it and it is you know you're you're still stitching together in post it's still combining the two images into one sort of deliverable right. but you're not doing it's it. it's doing it on its own you don't have to like manually do all that right. so yeah if you already use premiere 
you have to do almost nothing differently. Yeah, basically. And um, you will know that even before you have any VR footage in there, if you want to make sure your Premiere is up to date in that way, you can right click on just any media in a Premiere project. And then I'm pretty sure if you go to modify, you'll have four options next to modify. I'm going, I'm closing my eyes and going back into my <laughs> premiere mind palace yeah mind palace <laughs> but you go into the memory banks um you'll hit modify and then if you have i'm pretty sure it's premiere 2020 or later you'll have four options at the bottom it'll say vr properties and then that'll take you to this whole tab in that window of whatever the other stuff that modify has a whole another tab for its vr properties and if the footage is correct it, the very top thing should say like as shot or like same as clip. And then that will say stereo 180 degree stereoscopic VR. So that's kind of just like a good way to know that you're good to go. The plugin is installed and it can interpret your footage as VR footage. And it's, and it's awesome. There's even a mode in Premiere to click around and view it at like as VR footage, which obviously is now you're getting to be, um, different than your regular timeline stuff. Like you can't view your regular video and that type of stuff that only works for the VR stuff. But point being is Premiere is really well optimized for this stuff now. And that's pretty exciting. I feel like everybody is just finally coming together on VR to support from like the production side to the post-production plugins in Premiere and then to on delivery, uh, YouTube and Facebook and most other like popular video platforms pretty much just support this stuff natively. There's not much you have to do, right? You smell that? It's that synergy. It's synergy. <laughs> Everybody, everybody's coming together. It smells <laughs> fantastic. Yeah, that's the smell <laughs> of Facebook owning the yeah. biggest VR company. I know. Yeah, it actually doesn't smell so good. On, on right. <laughs> it, it smells a little fishy, foul, if I'm being honest. Foul after smell. <laughs> <laughs> right. And it's certainly easier, though. You no, know, the integration. No, you. Well, you laugh as much as much as you do, but the integration is really impressive. Um, it's awesome. So yeah, YouTube now um, fully has that virtual reality um, integration in it. So just like Premiere knew that that R five footage was one hundred and eighty degree stereoscopic VR footage via baked in metadata in the firmware, YouTube can similarly know that it is a interactive VR video in that way because Premiere can attach metadata to the clip when you export it that lets YouTube know that it's VR. So everybody's just giving each other a big old VR hug in this world and say, here you go, here's your VR mm-hmm. <laughs> media. Um, and it, and, it, and it, it really is streamlines and it works. The camera attaches metadata to the clip so it uses it in Premiere, and then Premiere knows that it's VR, and then you export it from Premiere. YouTube knows that it's VR video from Premiere, and then now you upload a video onto YouTube, and it's just, boom, it, it just works. It's great. Does YouTube support stereoscopic 3D? So, and again, half step ahead of everybody, this is something that I just figured out like a couple of days ago. I thought that it was just the click and drag slash move your phone to look around like the angled view. I did think that it was just like that on desktop. It is all you can do is scroll around and do the click and drag view on desktop on mobile. You have the option to either do the angled view, like using your phone to look around, or you can put it into the goggle mode. You can put it into the goggle vision. So for some VR headsets that, um, just use a mobile device like that. You just like put the mobile device like in front of the goggles. I think those are maybe some of the cheaper ones. Mm-hmm. Maybe it doesn't get the effect off like so much, but yes, YouTube knows to do that too. So for viewing on mobile devices, it gives you that option to put it in the stereoscopic mode. Um, I just oh, figured that out like two days ago. Nice. So on YouTube, not only are you getting the YouTube will support 8K resolution now, which is wild. So not only are you getting that, you're also getting, you know, your field of view with VR and you're also getting stereoscopic 3D, which makes this stuff look truly great. The footage out of this thing looks awesome. Yeah, we haven't really covered that yet, that basic fact, but it 
if you nail your focus and nail your exposure and do everything correctly, it looks uh, fantastic. It really does look great. I am like actually super impressed at the video quality. If you do get it right, it is tack sharp focus. The um, exposure and everything looks great. And it's just so fun to be able to click and scroll uh, around <laughs> around your yeah, video. Very cool. And yeah, if you if you throw a headset on the order too, you can sort of like I, I was like reviewing these clips. Luckily, I, I would export individual clips and then just like click them, drag them over to the headset. Right. So I was I was only working with like 15 or 20 second clips at a time. But yeah, I, I would definitely if you're going to shoot a whole project with this thing, plan on more storage than you would normally need, more time than you would normally need, faster Internet than you would normally need. Everything is a lot bigger. <laughs> Yeah, with all this integration, obviously, like um, there's work that needs to be done, like on the back end. I'm sure it'll yeah. only get faster and faster and stuff, too. But but yeah, I mean, all that said, all those caveats and like you have to remember this and you have to do this and this will take longer. All of with all those problems, this is still like the easiest way to shoot quality VR by like a mile. Oh, my God. And it's so cool too. just like take a step back and just like think about this. It's It's actually super cool that. Yeah. And it has streamlined this type of thing. Once you figure it out, it's awesome. So just like nutshell, yeah. R5 with the firmware, with the current firmware, dual fish islands, take nice steady footage, make sure it's in focus, download the VR utility program or the plugin, and that'll take care of the footage for you. And if it's going to YouTube, YouTube will know from your premiere export by the way there's just like a tiny little tab at the bottom of the export panel that literally just says this is vr video that's the mm -hmm. metadata i'm talking about <laughs> I, didn't, yeah. I didn't mention that before but that's all you have to do in premiere a sentence yeah it is literally one sentence it's like this is vr video it again super easy like a lot less intimidating than what you'd think and then that's all it takes for youtube to know that it is vr video Rent this thing, shoot some VR, test it out. Like a R5 and this lens and a Quest 2 headset are like not a super expensive weekend rental. And I, I think, you know, if you're interested in shooting VR at all, this is a perfect place to start. And yeah, like um, professionally, like if your client wants VR video now, I mean, like you can tell them it's pretty easily achievable. Or actually, you can tell them it's super hard, but I'm so specialized and skilled that I know just what to do. And then, yeah, I'm going to yeah. charge you triple per hour, <laughs> yeah, but it is doable. <laughs> yeah, that is achievable. I need to pull out all the stops. Yeah, thankfully, you've hired me. Yeah, exactly. And then uh, between you and me, it's actually super streamlined now. We'll link to Dom's videos on it. So uh, those are very helpful explainers about kind of the nuts and bolts of using this thing, especially when it comes to post-production. Good and bad pros and cons. I think Dom threw up some sample footage where you know there are focus mistakes so you can see kind of what that looks like totally. not to not to shout dom out here i i think no, that was no. an intentional choice yeah no, completely. you should Sorry. see what it looks like if you don't nail focus precisely yeah and the the sample footage looks great yeah thanks i'm curious um i'm gonna do a shorter video and really export it at like the maxed out bit rate and see and see if that gets it really like crispy and like that gets the motion smooth and stuff so, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to keep testing with this thing myself Is it whatever weekends I can get my hand on it. it it's I want really, to shoot VR video all the time now. Yeah, no, it's a fun like, thing to just kind of get in or mess around with. Oh, it really is. I want to do a music video a tour of my own house, <laughs> whatever. I, I will view all of that content in yes. beautiful 8K <laughs> stereoscopic 3D. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming in. Oh, uh, dude, thanks for having me. It's always so much fun. Keep me updated on your on your VR journey. Oh, yeah, I will. Let's view each other's experience in 180 degree stereoscopic VR. With our Dom's going to come out of this like lawnmower man. Yeah. You're fully just going to transcend physical reality. I'm going to become completely unfamiliar with the with the real world around me. Just getting it's all VR gonna, from now I'm on. I'm going to edit in VR. I'm going to cook in VR. Well, I'll see you after the singularity when we're all in the meta space. OK, yeah, sounds good. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Sweet dude. Peace. Thanks for listening to the Lunch Rentals podcast. You'll find links in the show notes to the 5.2 millimeter dual fisheye, the R5, everything we covered today, including Dom's super helpful videos on beginner VR video production. 
As always, be sure to go to lynchrentals.com slash podcast for a discount on your next order from us. And if you're enjoying the show, you can support it by subscribing and giving us a review on Apple Podcasts. We're on Instagram and Twitter at Lens Rentals, and thanks to Jacques Granger for our theme music. More of his work can be found at revengebodymemphis.bandcamp.com. On the next episode of the Lens Rentals podcast, how to buy a used camera. Roger and Joey will draw from their years of experience fixing our broken gear to tell you how to buy something that's less likely to break. Find out how to avoid getting scammed on Craigslist on the next episode of the Lens Rentals podcast. Bye.